Hey guys, Dr. Betzer coming out with another fantastic chemistry video. And today we're going to talk about resonance forms. Probably the most important thing you're going to learn uh, in this chapter, resonance forms. It's not really an exaggeration to say in organic chemistry, if you don't know the answer to a question, guess resonance. It's probably going to be correct. This is kind of how it works in organic chemistry, guys. So with that in mind, let's learn what resonance is. So here we go. The structure of some compounds is not adequately, adequately represented by a single Lewis structure. This is true. Resonance forms are Lewis structures that can be interconverted by moving electrons only. You do not ever move atoms. Okay? You only move electrons. The true structure will be a hybrid between the contributing resonance structures. So let's take a look. Right here are resonance forms. Okay? There's this one. And then there's this one. And they're not equal. They're certainly not equal in weight. We'll get into how you weight resonance forms here in a moment. But they are both significant. They both contribute to the overall hybrid structure. Okay? Now what's going on here? Notice this carbon has a plus charge and a sextet. And adjacent to it is an atom with lone pairs. That's a good thing. Because these lone pairs can kick in to form a double bond between this carbon and this nitrogen. Now, we should talk about arrows for a minute. When you have an arrow, a double-headed arrow like this, this means two electrons are moving. Two electrons are moving. If you have an arrow like this, they're called fish hook arrows, one electron is moving. one electron is moving. So there's double-headed arrows and single-headed arrows. Two electron movements, double-headed arrow. One electron movement, single-headed arrow, or also known as the um, fish hook arrow. Now, what's happening here is these two lone pairs, or sorry, these two electrons that are part of the lone pair are kicking in and going down into here. So they're going from here to here to form a double bond between this nitrogen and that carbon. Now, why can they do that? Because they're not bonded to anything else, so they can move around. And they're going towards an atom that has a positive charge and a sextet. Now, if this atom had a positive charge and an octet, they couldn't do this because you can't break the octet rule ever. You never break the octet rule. Now, it goes towards the positive charge, forms a double bond between this carbon and this nitrogen, and you get this resonance form right here. Now notice this arrow here that has a double head on the right and a double head on the left. This is called a resonance arrow. It tells the reader that what's coming after this is a resonance form of what came before it. Okay, So when you have two resonance forms, you have to put this arrow in between them. That tells the reader that these two things are resonance forms of each other. Okay? Now, the overall hybrid structure looks something like this. Notice there's not a true bond or true double bond between the two of them. There's a little dash bond in between the two of them, and that's indicating that there's not a true double bond here. It's telling us that there's a partial double bond here and that both of these atoms are sharing the positive charge. Okay? Notice it's delta positive on the carbon and delta positive on the nitrogen. This is important because what resonance allows you to do is predict where charges are, even if they're just partial charges. Okay, Resonance also allows you to move charge around. So notice in this resonance form, the plus charge is on the carbon. In this one, it's on the nitrogen. That's kind of like sharing the misery. Okay, You're moving the misery around through numerous atoms. That's a stabilizing effect. I didn't say it was chemically inert. I said it's stabilizing. Okay, Still reactive. This, this ion is still going to be very reactive. It's just going to be more stable. So it'll be more uh, longer lasting, say. It'll react a little bit slower. I did not say it was chemically inert. It certainly will react. Okay, So that's kind of in a nutshell what resonance is. It's the moving of electrons, not atoms, to stabilize charges, to move charges around, or to predict where, char where partial charges might be. Okay, And that's going to help us with reactivity down the road. 
So here are the top four things you look at when weighting resonance forms. Because believe it or not, most resonance forms are not created equal. If you have an ion or a molecule with, say, 20 resonance forms, which is possible, very possible, actually, um, not every resonance form you draw is going to be equal to the other ones. In fact, they're all likely going to have different weights. What's the first thing you look for? Octets everywhere. If, or, you know, filled valence shells. Obviously, you can have duets for hydrogen, right? Remember, hydrogen only ever has one bond. Don't ever draw more than one bond of hydrogen, or you'll make me cry. Okay? Octets. As many octets as possible. So if you have a resonance form that has a sextet and a resonance form that has an octet, the one with the octet is better. It will weigh heavier in the overall hybrid structure. As many bonds as possible. So if you can maximize the bonds, that's also good. Octets everywhere first, number of bonds is second. After that, and this is also a very, very common one. The negative charge is on the most electronegative atom. So if you can put a negative charge on an oxygen, that's a good thing. That's a good thing. But notice, it's number three. Octets everywhere is still number one. So if you have to break the octet to get a negative charge on an oxygen or an electronegative atom, that's not as good as having octets everywhere. All right, octets everywhere is better. Has as little charge separation as possible. That's also very important. You want to keep charges uh, close together. Now, when I say charges, I don't mean two positive charges. No, 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 no. A positive and a negative. Keep them close together. That's a good thing. If you have two positive charges, you want those bad boys as far apart as you can get them. If you have two negative charges, same thing. Get them as far apart as you can get them, and that's better. Okay? All right. So here we go. We're going to talk about major and minor contributors to the overall resonance form. Okay? Notice here, we have formaldehyde. Now, look what's happening. We're saying that the double bond now is going to move its electrons. Remember, the double bond has four electrons, and only two of them now are going to move up to the oxygen. Okay, that's what this arrow is telling me. Two electrons from here, because remember, double-headed arrow moves two electrons. Two electrons from here are going to go to the oxygen. When you do that, you're taking two electrons away from carbon. So you're going to get something that looks like this. Okay? It's going to look just like this. Now, you're moving two electrons to the oxygen. This oxygen already has two lone pairs. You're moving two more electrons up there, so you're moving another lone pair to the oxygen. One, two, three lone pairs, and a negative charge. Okay? This oxygen is negative, and the carbon is positive. So that's good. You have the adjacent uh, opposite charges. That's a good thing. That's a stabilizing thing. But the big problem with this resonance form, the big problem with this resonance form, no octet on carbon. So that's immediately going to make it the weaker contributor. It's going to make it the lesser contributor immediately because it doesn't have an octet on carbon. But it doesn't mean this doesn't exist or this resonance form doesn't contribute. Okay? It doesn't mean that. It certainly does contribute. But this one over here is your major contributor. Okay? So in the overall hybrid structure between these two resonance forms, this one will predominate. Or, or excuse me, this one predominates and gives the most character to the hybrid structure. But now notice, delta negative, the oxygen in this molecule is, neg is slightly negative. The carbon is slightly positive. So let's imagine then, if we added hydronium to this or a proton, let's imagine if we just added acid to this molecule. Where's it going to go? Where's, where's the hydrogen or the H plus going to react to? Where's it going to go? Well, if this is positive, and this is slightly negative, and this is slightly positive, this hydrogen is going to be repelled by the carbon. It's going to be pushed away. So they're never going to collide. Remember, reactions have to have collision, orientation, and enough speed. There we go, twist them around. And enough speed to make the reaction go. So collision, orientation, and speed. If you don't have the right, uh, sorry, if you don't collide, you'll never react. So this proton and this carbon are the same charge or similar charges. They're going to repel each other. They'll never collide. This oxygen is negative. This is positive. These two things are going to collide all day long because they're opposite charges. So these two things are going to react. All right? Or possibly could react. I shouldn't say they're going to. Now, that's why you need to understand where charges are. If you understand where positive charges or negative charges, a lot of this stuff is start, going to start to make sense. Because you have to collide. If you can collide, you can react. 
And that's why resonance forms are, that's one of the reasons why they're so darn important. Okay. All right. Here's another example. When both resonance forms obey the octet rule, the major contributor is the one with the negative charge on the most electronegative atom. Okay. The most electronegative atom. Well, here we have a bunch of lone pairs and a carbon with multiple bonds. So you can actually draw resonance forms here. There we go. What's happening here is this, this lone pair, or you could have used the one on the bottom, or you could have used this one. It doesn't matter which lone pair you pick. I picked this one because it was convenient. It's going to form a double bond between the oxygen and the carbon. As soon as you do that, though, if you don't move a bond out of the carbon, you're going to violate the octet rule. So one of these bonds has to move out and go to nitrogen. The electrons from this bond go out here to nitrogen to avoid violating the octet rule. If you had just left it as this arrow here, you would have had an octet rule violation, and I would have marked you down for that very severely for breaking the octet rule. So donus. Lone pair kicks in, forms a double bond to carbon. The triple bond has to kick out one of its bonds to nitrogen to avoid breaking the octet rule. And when you do that, you put a negative charge onto nitrogen. So which one of these two will be the, the most or the major contributor? It's going to be this one. Why? Because this has octets everywhere. This has octets everywhere. But this one has the negative charge on the oxygen. This one has the negative charge on the nitrogen. Okay? That's important. It's always going to be like that. So in the overall hybrid structure of this, if we want to draw it together, be something like that. But if you really want to be kind of cute about it, you can draw this delta negative huge. It's a big delta negative. I'll just draw it big and bold. There we go. And this delta negative here, let's see if we can just kind of be cute about this. You can just draw a little baby delta negative, okay? Because that nitrogen is not going to have much of the delta negative charge, or the negative charge. The oxygen is going to bear the brunt. So if it, then this molecule here, or this ion, if we add, a, say, an acid to this, the acid will more than likely will react to the oxygen because it's the most negative. The nitrogen is the least negative. Now, you may get a mixture of both reacting, but primarily the oxygen is going to react because it's primarily bearing the negative charge. Here's another example. Opposite charges should be on adjacent atoms, if you can do it. Now, notice here what's happening is the lone pair from here is kicking down, and we kick it out here. That's what's happening here. That's the resonance form that's, that's occurring. Now, here, we actually separate. The, we have a positive and a negative, and they're quite far apart. They're isolated by a single atom. So that's not really good. So this actually is your major contributor because you don't have any charge separation at all. So this will be your major contributor, and that's because it doesn't have charge separation. And that this is kind of a very odd example. You don't see this very often, but it does occur, so I want you to know about it. And here's one for you to try. So go ahead and pause the video. Take your, oops, I'll just draw this out for you so you can see it. Take your time. Try to do resonance forms for this ion on your own. Try to do resonance forms for that on your own. Pause the video, come on back, and we'll go over it. All right, guys, welcome back. So let's go over this uh, resonance form. Well, we have electrons, or lone pairs, I should say, adjacent to a carbon with a plus charge. So they're going to resonate to it. They're going to go like this. Notice I drew the double-headed arrow from the electrons to the bond. I didn't draw it to the carbon. I drew it to the bond. That tells me the bond is being formed between those two atoms. Okay. I draw a resonance arrow. Oops. 
plus charge. There you go. There's a plus charge on that oxygen. So the overall hybrid structure of these two things will be something like this. Okay, that's the overall hybrid structure. Now, the major contributor would be this one. This would be our major contributor, and that's because it has octets everywhere. Every atom has an octet. The hydrogens have duets, of course. This one, the carbon has a sextet, so it's not as good. So it doesn't count for as much. So this oxygen is actually very delta positive. It's very delta positive. The carbon is less so. Okay, so that's how we do it, and that's how it's done. Pretty simple, right? Hopefully you got it. If not, back the video up. Try it again on your own. Make sure you can do these things. And here's another example. So go ahead and pause the video. Um, let me just put a couple things in here for you. There you go. There's a couple lone pairs here already. So go ahead, pause the video right now, and see if you can do resonance forms for this molecule, or this ion, excuse me. All right, welcome back. So here we go. We have a carbon with a negative charge. Everybody here has an octet, so that's good. That's good. Let's see if we can do better. So notice what we're doing here is we have a lone pair beside a carbon or beside an atom with a double bond. This can resonate. If you have a double bond adjacent to a carbon with a lone pair, it can resonate. A double bond adjacent to any atom with a lone pair, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, it doesn't matter, as long as it's adjacent. So this carbonyl or this carbon to oxygen double bond is adjacent to a lone pair. So this can resonate. What I've done is I've taken the lone pair and I've resonated it to, to here. So it formed a bond between these two carbons. Now if I stop there, I'm going to violate the octet rule at carbon. I can't do that. So what has to happen is the bond electrons come up to the oxygen just like that. Okay? So let me go over that again. What's happening is the lone pair comes down, donates into the uh, bond, so it makes a bond between carbon and carbon. This bond has to break and go to the oxygen because you can't violate the octet rule. And that's going to give us resonance forms like this. There we go. Now, I want to be clear on this now. This is not the correct Lewis structure. And this is not the correct Lewis structure. The correct Lewis structure is somewhere in the middle of these two. Okay? So remember that. Resonance forms aren't, they, neither one of them is correct. They're correct resonance forms for sure, but they're not the correct Lewis structure. The correct, correct Lewis structure is somewhere between them, and we kind of don't know where exactly because we're not doing any calculation, but we can figure it out. We can figure out who's he more heavily weighted. So in the overall hybrid structure, Looks something like this. Delta negative, oh, put the hydrogen in. Delta negative. Now, the most significant contributor here should be this one. I hope that I hope that you all got that. Now, why should this one be more significant? Well, because the anion, the negative charge, is on the oxygen, whereas in this one it's on the carbon. Oxygen is much more electronegative than carbon, so therefore the negative charge should be on the oxygen. Or it's more, sorry, it's more stable on the oxygen. Now, that doesn't mean that this carbon doesn't have a negative charge. It certainly does, or delta negative, partial negative. But that just means, simply it means the oxygen is going to bear the more of the brunt of that negative charge. Because it's more or negative, it can accommodate it. It's going to attract those electrons anyway. All right? Now that, oh, one more thing, sorry. We have to talk about acetate. Now, here we have an acid in, in equilibrium with its conjugate base. So here's our carboxylic acid. It deprotonates to form hydronium, and you get the acetate ion. So this is the conjugate base of a carboxylic acid. They're, they're you know, fairly acidic, actually, for organic molecule, because it can resonate. Notice you have oxygen here with a negative charge, kicks in its lone pair. This bond breaks and goes to oxygen, and you get this resonance form. And I know you're probably thinking, well, they're basically the same thing, right? 
more or less, yes. But what the important thing to take home here is you have a negative charge on oxygen here and a negative charge on oxygen here. These two resonance forms are equivalent. They're the same. So in the overall hybrid structure of a carboxylic acid, oops, you have equivalent resonance forms and you put the negative charge on oxygen both times. And that's a good thing. Putting the negative charge onto oxygen is very stabilizing. It's very stabilizing. And in fact, the more you can stabilize this conjugate base, the more you can stabilize this conjugate base, the more acidic your molecule will be or the further to the right the equilibrium will lie. Okay? That's very, very important. Very, very important. In fact, why don't you guys on your own take this ion, which you should recognize, It's going to be hydrogen sulfate or bisulfate. There we go. Go ahead and resonate this. Now, when you're resonating it, don't worry. Don't worry about this oxygen here. This oxygen will resonate too. But I want you to worry about this ion resonating. So go ahead and, and on your own, draw resonance forms for this ion. And use your resonance forms. And think about it for a second. Sulfate, or sorry, uh, bisulfite, bisulfate, excuse me, is the conjugate base of sulfuric acid which is a strong acid. Using this resonance, using this ion and the resonance forms you're going to draw, explain why. Explain why it should be a strong acid. Why should the equilibrium lie all the way to the right? Okay? It's a complicated question, so give it a try, and we'll discuss it in class if you have any questions, okay? You should have questions about this. And with that, we're going to stop this video. It's gone a little bit long. Sorry about that, guys. I tried to stop them at 10 minutes. This one went to 21. I just, it's the nature of resonance. It's complicated, and you're, you're going to struggle with it. I want you to struggle with it, um, but the only way to get good at it is to struggle with it. So go ahead and get after it. Now, with that, I want to wish you all good luck and good chemistry. We'll see you soon.